Hi, and welcome back to Brain and Behavior. Uh, this chapter, chapter 12, we will be talking about um, different factors that influence behavior. Uh, I call this generally causes of behavior, but we'll be looking at uh, this chapter as a, a way to look at how further um, relationships exist between brain and behavior. And it does come across a little bit as a grab bag, but I think if you take this as a, a series of independent or related um, factors, such as emotion uh, and motivated behaviors, you'll see that they can have both a evolutionary influence and an environmental influence. And we can see where there's a limitation in some of those or where there's a intersection between those factors. So in general, this chapter will first discuss some evidence that we have inherited or uh, have these innate kinds of behaviors that we're born with that can come to influence our behavior. We'll talk about those first. And then we'll talk about some evidence that we learn from our environment or that we gain information from our environment and that shapes our responding. We'll talk about those. We'll see our next section, we'll talk about preparedness, um, we'll uh, evaluate this idea that our evolutionary history shapes the extent of what we can learn and that there are some restrictions on that. Um, so it's a combination of evolution and learning information from our environment. So uh, that will be the, uh, that next section. Then we'll talk a little bit of evidence of how emotion, which is present in some of these situations where we're learning from our environment uh, is regulated by or controlled or influenced by the central nervous system. So we'll talk about how the central nervous system contributes to emotion in certain structures. Then we'll finish talking about motivated behavior. This idea that we um, can change our behavior because we are in a certain state that we're motivated to eat or to explore and examine those different types of factors that influence that, uh, um, those factors. So this uh, section will be a set of examples of how evolution and environment come to influence our behaviors and emergent from those can be processes like emotion or motivated behaviors. So let's go ahead and get uh, started talking about some of these environmental and uh, evolutionary influences, such as um, what we see with certain innate uh, behaviors or these inherited behaviors um, are often uh, triggered by um, some kind of stimulus in the environment or an innate re uh, releasing mechanism. So that is typically observed or activated and behaviors that are critical or aid in survival of the organism. So you might see these innate behaviors uh, related to feeding, reproduction, or escaping from certain predators. Uh, so these, these kinds of stimuli in the environment will trigger a uh, response from the animal that is referred to as the fixed action pattern. So the innate releasing mechanism is the stimulus uh, in the environment that triggers the sequence or set of motor muscle behaviors that occur almost reflexively in response to that stimulus. And these are observed really independent of any kind of learning from the environment. And we want to give you a couple examples of these um, uh, um, uh, um, these innate releasing mechanisms and the fixed action patterns. So our first example comes from gull feeding. So uh, gulls, when they return back to the nest, they're going to feed their young. The young actually have to peck at the beak of the parent. And when it does so, it causes the parent to regurgitate what it had eaten into the offspring's mouth. And so 
researchers were interested in, what was the critical stimulus? What was the innate releasing mechanism um, that uh, triggers this pecking behavior in the infants? So from a very young age, they have to be able to do this. And if you can't do it, you're not going to be fed. So it's a very important kind of behavior in the animal survival. So here we see uh, these red bars indicate the pecking rate of the offspring. And this represents the stimulus that was used. So what we here see is using a very realistic kind of model here and increasing some of the contrast, we can see that there's a little increase in the pecking rate. But if you present a model that is lacking a beak, well, you don't see much pecking, or you just present the beak by itself, um, you see more pecking. But if you present a, um, a stimulus that is large yellow with these red bands on it, it can elicit a very high rate of responding, higher than what you actually see associated with a real stimulus. So there's something about that beak, the contrast offered by the yellow and the red, those stripes there, that is really the essence of that um, innate releasing mechanism that then causes those fixed action patterns of pecking at that that we're recording the pecking rate here. Now, you can do things where you then get more subtle, where you remove the spot. You see that doesn't generate much pecking. Uh, or you can have it where there's no movement. And we can see that that produces an equivalent kind of response rate. Or you can try to change the orientation, the shape, the color, or even uh, the location of the spot and see that that has a certain impact on the fine. Uh, so there's some flexibility. <clears throat> or at least there's a range in the stimuli that are essential for uh, eliciting these fixed action patterns or this pecking response to that. Again, this is inherited or innate kinds of behaviors that are um, uh, able to elicit a kind of flexible response within range. I mean, we're talking about pecking, but we see that when we change that uh, um, when we change the stimulus characteristics, we can change the magnitude of that fixed action pattern. So <clears throat> we can see that there's some real flexibility there in that. Now, this is a goal. And do we see any evidence of this in other organisms? And we do. We actually see uh, evidence of this in humans. So if you make a face, a, a baby will also cop, try to copy that face. Very early on, we see this occurring. So the sight of the uh, parent's face uh, demonstrating some kind of emotion, such as surprise, happiness, uh, or even their sadness, you can see those characteristics. And the child will make that fixed action pattern of those muscles contracting the face to reproduce that um, to reproduce that emotion or that facial expression. Um, so again, the fixed, uh, the innate releasing mechanism is the parent's face, the emotion that's being expressed, and the fixed action pattern would be the muscle contractions in the baby's face, trying to draw or create a link, a bond with that parent. And this kind of responsiveness occurs very early. Now, we know that it doesn't depend on learning feedback. Because even blind children will show us these kinds of emotions, obviously not using the parent, but they show that they can make these emotions when they're satisfied or, or when you scare them or those kinds of things uh, with a loud noise, that they are able to make those same kinds of facial expressions. So it's not simply a, uh, a learning or, or it's not a matter of learning from the parent, but it seems to be more of a innate kind of behavior uh, with that. So um, that's another dimension that we see that these essential uh, aspects or survival are supported by these evolutionary uh, influences. This The organism's evolutionary history uh, has as they're born, certain programs of behaviors that are installed genetically and unfold when those stimuli are present. Another 
excellent example of this in terms of procuring uh, resources from the environment, such as food, is the complexity. So you might say, well, pecking at a um, pecking at a bill or mimicking a face that seems pretty simple, uh, and it doesn't take much time to do that. Uh, but how complex can these uh, fixed action patterns be? And what we can see is they can be amazingly complex as an example of a spider spinning a web. Uh, you can imagine the amount of time it takes to spin a web, the complex dynamics of spinning a web, and we can see that this is an example of when the stimuli are presented in the environment, the spider will then uh, start to engage in producing this fixed action pattern, uh, as we see here, of spinning a web. Uh, and this can change depending on uh, the environmental conditions. So it does show some flexibility, but I think the spider spinning a web is a great example of the complexity of the behavior. And it's one of those things that we have to really be careful in observing behavior in animals and humans and trying to attribute it to learning or some kind of evolutionary process. Our next um, kind of influence is learning from the environment. We've already talked about conditioned taste aversion earlier in light of morphine uh, tolerance. But just to review here, uh, Pavlov uh, was interested in looking at how the body prepares to receive food. And so he would present a dog with uh, a tone and pair it with some food. Um, so uh, what happened over time of pairing food with a tone is the dog would start to drool or uh, increase the rate that it would produce saliva uh, to the uh, tone itself. And so the unconditioned stimulus or stimulus that always reflexively produces um, food is uh, would be uh, reflexively produces saliva would be the food, and the unconditioned response, the reflex would be drooling, the conditioned stimulus, because we pair that uh, tone with food over multiple trials, what happens is that now the drooling starts to occur to the tone when it's presented by itself, or you're drooling to the tone, and so the, uh, that conditioned response is elicited from the tone. Um, so these are uh, a good example of how interacting with the environment, learning the relationship between these stimuli, tones, <clears throat> and food can prepare the body in anticipation. But you have to have that experience. So that environment has to provide those stimuli in order to produce that. Now, a good example of this is conditioned taste aversion. Uh, conditioned taste aversion is a situation where you take and consume some kind of food or drink that makes you sick. And um, I've, I have a conditioned taste aversion, I don't know how it happened, but to peanut butter. So at some point I must have um, ingested or eaten some peanut butter and got sick, such as from the flu, and after that I've not been able to eat peanut butter my whole life. Yeah, not even Reese's peanut butter cups. Uh, which, you know, my family enjoys greatly. Um, but I, I open one up and it just smells as bad as the first time uh, I open it up. Now, I'm not allergic to peanut butter. It's just I learned an association between that flavor and some other illness that occurs. Some of you may have had some experience with this in terms of alcohol um, in where you've consumed a certain amount of alcohol and it was flavored, such as maybe tequila and margaritas or some other flavor. And that uh, flavor was the conditioned stimulus. The alcohol itself, uh, the high level of alcohol that you consume, was the unconditioned stimulus. Now, when you consume large amounts of alcohol, you can become sick uh, and uh, so it produces your sickness, but because you associate these two things together, these environmental cues, the alcohol, the U.S., and the flavor, the C.S., what happens is the next time that you smell uh, tequila or some other alcoholic beverage, you'll get that kind of sensation of sickness or illness. So you might want to kind of uh, think about that um, 
when you're thinking about foods that you like or don't like and try to retrace that. Oh, wait, was that when I got sick with the flu after eating that, that kind of different flavored food? And uh, that represents that conditioned taste aversion or learning about stimuli from the environment. Uh, so now, uh, in addition to classical conditioning, we also have operant conditioning. This is different from classical conditioning because with operant conditioning, what we're doing is we're learning responses and outcomes. A certain response, action that an organism makes will lead to certain outcomes. And those outcomes can result in the application or removal of some type of stimulus. Uh, so you can imagine that um, if you apply, if you, after you make a response, such as we can see BF Skinner over here with the Skinner box, if you make some kind of response that's good, a piece of food, to an animal, um, what you'll see is that there'll be an increase in the likelihood of seeing that behavior again for pressing the lever or moving to the side of the box. However, if an animal makes a response and it gets a negative outcome, something that's unpleasant, such as maybe uh, a very loud noise, um, what's going to happen is you're going to decrease the likelihood of seeing that kind of response in the future. So uh, application of a positive stimulus or positive reinforcement will result in a net increase in behavior. Uh, application of a negative stimulus, something that's versatile, something that is not pleasant, uh, is called positive punishment and result in a net decrease in that resulting behavior. Uh, so you can imagine um, you did something in school and um, or at, you get home and you get spanked for it. That is a, an example of punishment, positive punishment. Some aversive stimulus is applied because of some behavior that occur. Uh, removal, now you can make a response and we can either remove a stimulus uh, that's positive or remove a stimulus that's negative. And so uh, removing a positive stimulus is known as negative punishment or emission training. I'm kind of uh, from an old school learning theory background and we always used to refer it to as emission, emission training. But now the textbooks have been changing that to negative punishment. So the, both of those terms are interchangeable, negative punishment or emission training. So by removing a positive stimulus, something that you like is, uh, is um, going to result in decreasing that response that occurred. Uh, and so that's a good way to shape or decrease those unwanted behaviors. So removal of positive stimulus is called negative punishment or emission training, and it's going to result in a decrease in that behavior. Now removing something that's negative is going to result in an increase in that kind of behavior. So removal of a negative stimulus in the environment, an aversive stimulus in the environment, is going to result in a net increase in those behaviors. A good example of that is you get a headache that's a negative stimulus, and what do you do? You would take an aspirin. So you're going to try to remove that. And that's going to increase your aspirin-taking behavior uh, when you have a headache to try to remove or eliminate that kind of uh, um, negative or aversive stimulus, and it's going to increase that behavior. So that's called negative reinforcement. So just to review again, we have positive reinforcement. That's the application uh, or presentation of a positive stimulus after something response occurs from the organism. That's going to result in an increase in likelihood of seeing that. We have the application of something negative because of response occurs, and that's positive punish punishment, which will result in a decrease in behavior. We have um, the removal of something positive that's called negative punishment or emission training, and that's going to result in a net decrease in those behaviors. And then we have negative reinforcement, where it is a removal of a negative stimulus, and that will result in a net increase in the behavior. So again, 
Hybrid conditioning is different from classical conditioning in that a response outcome association is being made, whereas in classical conditioning, a um, two stimuli are being learned about, a conditioned stimulus and an unconditioned stimulus. So uh, these are clear examples of environmental influences learning from the environment. And we also spoke a little bit about how our evolutionary history has set us up to um, engage or exhibit certain behaviors. What we're going to talk now is this idea of preparedness, uh, that because of our evolutionary history, we see that we're prepared to learn about certain stimuli, but other stimuli we tend not to learn about. And this, this study that we'll talk about here falls, uh, is referred to as the Garcia effect, that we're prepared to learn about taste illness associations, and we're prepared to learn about uh, auditory or visual um, fear-producing kinds of stimuli, but we don't see much of a crossover. So you're not going to learn to be afraid uh, of a certain flavor, and you're not going to learn to be ill or feel sick to certain lights or tones. They don't cross over. So we see that we tend to learn illness associations with flavors, but not lights or tones. We tend to learn fear associations uh, or uh, this kind of um, uh, um, emotional response uh, that is uh, fear to lights and tones, but not to flavors. And so how did we do this? Well, Garcia had a study where um, a rat uh, a thirsty rat would go over and lick some fluid that had a certain flavor uh, and that every time it licked this little spout, what would happen is that it would taste the flavor and a tone would turn on and a light would turn on. So a rat would walk over to its, in this cage and it would lick this little light, uh, this little tube and it would start to taste some flavor. Uh, maybe a lemonade, as we have here. And as it was looking, lights and tones would turn on. And then what would happen is that as it was doing that, there would be two groups, okay? So uh, two groups would uh, have very different kinds of um, associations formed. One group would receive a shock every time it licked uh, that with that light and tone. Another group would be made sick by injecting something that makes them sick. Lithium chloride is a good example of that, uh, where if you inject a rat, it will stimulate um, simulate this sensation of getting sick, although you're not really uh, going to be uh, likely to die because of it because it's not triggering the same kind of uh, immune system reaction. It's just making you feel sick. So. Remember, they, uh, all of them were, um, every time they licked, they would get a flavor, a tone, and a light. And we had two groups. One group would receive shock when they were licking, and another group would become sick. They would get sick as, as, uh, because we inject them with that, that uh, lithium chloride to make them feel ill. Now, the question is, what happens to behavior afterwards to these two groups? And so what we would do is first let's look at group shock, what they did. Group shock, we could see what happens when we play the tone or the light and when they're moving around on the cage. We can imagine if you're fearful and you've learned that whenever you get a tone or light, you're going to, uh, some shock is going to come, you're probably going to freeze. You're going to get ready to be prepared for that. And what happens is we see that they uh, freeze a great deal, or they're not moving very much. This is percent moving on uh, the y-axis is percent moving or percent drinking, which we'll get to next. And we see with the tone and the light, they didn't move much. However, look at this. When they went over and were offered the lemonade or the lemon-flavored uh, fluid, we see that they drank a great deal. So they learn preferentially, or they're prepared to learn that when they receive shock, that um, the tone and light will become associated with that, but the flavor isn't associated with it because they consume a lot of that fluid. 
What about the group that received illness? We see the exact opposite pattern of results. Here, again, we're looking at percent moving for tone and light. When we present the tone and light to them, even though they received the illness producing solution, the US, uh, was illness that made them sick, the UR, uh, we see that the tone and light didn't really influence their behavior. They showed that they were moving a great deal in the chamber when the tone and light were presented. But when they went over and sampled the Kool-Aid, we see now they drank far less of that lemon flavored uh, substance. So here, what we see is that when the US was shock, they developed a condition response of fear related to the tone and light. Uh, but they didn't develop a condition response that was uh, an aversion to the Kool-Aid. When they received the US that was um, an illness, the lithium chloride, that produced the illness unconditioned response, we see that the tone of light isn't really changing or influencing their performance, their uh, movement in the apparatus when the tone or light are presented, but we see that now they're very aversive or they're uh, they're not likely to consume much of the Kool-Aid. So this idea that there's an evolutionary history where you'll tend to, when you taste something, learn that that makes you sick, but you're not going to learn visual or auditory associations with that. However, if you hear something rush, rustling uh, in the bushes or there's a certain noise, uh, that will then mean maybe there's a predator there. And so that will trigger a fear kind of response, an emotional reaction that will activate the body to try to prepare it. So that sound or some visual characteristics will trigger those responses, but you're not likely to feel sick in response to that noise. So these evolutionary histories have prepared us to learn about certain associations from the environment, but we see there's also some limitations where we don't see crossing over. So given this, uh, this Garcia effect, and what we've found out so far, how can we apply this? Can this be applied to help manage um, certain challenging situations, uh, such as, for example, wildlife uh, management. And there is uh, a couple of interesting videos, uh, which one I'll try to show you through Blackboard, but the link is on YouTube in Blackboard under the content, and I'll show you that um, here. But there are uh, indications that you can uh, deal with coyotes, wolves, or even mountain lions using this conditioned taste aversion and this idea that there's certain flavor, there's certain flavor illness associations that uh, we can use to help manage this. So in the, in the West, people uh, use a lot of farming or there are a lot of uh, uh, herds of sheep as well as bighorn sheep, which are uh, endangered species. But there's also a large mountain lion that, uh, for example, will attack. Uh, the big horn sheep, and they're also protected. And so to try to manage this population, people have observed or done tests in which they can give a, uh, um, uh, a predator such as a wolf or a coyote um, exposure to a, some meat from a sheep and have it poisoned with lithium chloride, just like we saw in the Garcia effect experiment, and then see does that change performance, or does that change um, does that change uh, the behavior of the animal? Because now, if they know when they eat this, they get sick. Will they avoid eating those animals? So is this a way to try to get them to prefer other other organisms in the environment that aren't endangered uh, or uh, uh, on the brink of becoming extinct? So this is a unique way to apply what we've learned about evolutionary history and learning from the environment to try to help with wildlife management. And so one of the videos I have here looks at that. And the link to this video is in, um, 
using Blackboard, and we'll just see how it plays. So we'll go ahead and, and start it. Walls are shown attacking a sheep. So again, the other video that I have in uh, Blackboard shows an application of how this can also be used to look at uh, changing sheep grazing patterns. So if there are plants that may be endangered or uh, um, and sheep are grazing those and we want to avoid those, we can also cause them to become, after they sample those, those plants, be sick and they will avoid those. So there's a lot of ways that this can be used in wildlife management using this, this kind of approach. Um, and what you'll notice uh, with this, again, is that they're learning this illness flavor kind of association or odor association. Um, and it's illustrating that there's this preparation. There's this um, uh, evolutionary history that's prepared to learn about certain stimuli, odor, old odors and flavors with certain illness. Um, and, and this can be useful in, uh, in, in treatment of certain conditions and other things. So there's a lot of applications for uh, this preparedness or this Garcia effect that we uh, just spoke about. Now, we'll turn from this idea of environmental and uh, uh, in evolutionary influences on behavior to talking about emotional behavior. But we'll see here, disgust is one of those emotions uh, that's produced when you think of one of those foods you can't eat, like when I think of peanut butter, uh, I have a disgust kind of reaction or emotion. So what are some factors that influence or what's the basis of those emotions? And we start a very low level talking about the autonomic nervous system. Remember, the autonomic nervous system is engaged when we are in those uh, emergency situations. And after that emergency situation is passed, and we need to repair or to, um, to uh, get back to our baseline levels. Now, the autonomic nervous system is divided into two components. And this will be important. I, I want you to pay attention to how this division occurs. The sympathetic diversion, division is involved in the fight or flight response. So let's say you're walking down an alley, and all of a sudden you start to hear footsteps behind you, and they start coming closer. And that's going to trigger that kind of emergency. I need to do something. I need to flee, or I need to fight. Activating the body. So activation of the sympathetic nervous system is going to increase heart rate, increase re respiration. It's going to inhibit digestion. Uh, it's going to stimulate the release of glucose. So that's going to be available for the, the body to use. Um, it's it's going to activate all these uh, kinds of things to get you to focus your energy so that you can either fight or flee that situation, that emergency situation. And what you'll know, notice about the, the, that 
that component is really found mostly in the thoracic and lumbar components of the spinal cord. So it's fairly localized in that area. So that division is involved in the fight or flight or bringing up the arousal uh, associated with that. Now, after that situation has ended, okay, so after we've uh, dealt with that situation, that high level of arousal, now what's going to happen is the parasympathetic division is going to come in and become active, and that's now going to uh, cause uh, a constriction of airways, a slow of the heart rate, uh, start to stimulate the digestion, uh, hence the name rest and digest. This then will uh, start reverse all those effects. But you'll notice that we have a lot of this coming off of the vagus nerve that's located very high here in, in the spinal cord here in the brainstem, and down here in the sacral segment of the spinal cord. So that's that most caudal end of the spinal cord. So there's an uneven distribution of these two systems. One arouses the system, and the other kind of inhibits and brings it back down to baseline levels. And so when we talk about emotional behavior, you have to imagine or you, you have the strong phenomenological experience that emotion does involve arousal. You know, think about uh, when you get really upset and you hear something and you get really upset and maybe it makes you angry and you have that kind of fire, that arousal that is that emotion of anger. Or you get very happy. You hear this amazing news that uh, something has happened and you get this, you get this level of arousal uh, that's uh, associated with this uh, uh, activation of the sympathetic division. So how do we know that these two systems, or is there any evidence that suggests that these two systems are involved in emotion? There's that kind of phenomenological experience that, yeah, you know, when I'm really upset about something, I'm angry, or I'm really happy, it seems like those are similar in that there's a, a, a great deal of arousal associated with it. But how do we uh, then come to... Uh, um, is there any evidence that, that this, these systems are involved? And in fact, there is, and it's from individuals that have had damage to their spinal cord at different levels. And so they've asked people to t change or talk about or use a survey to look at what is their reported uh, magnitude of emotional responses, either in terms of anger or fear, after damage to different levels of the spinal cord. And what we see is that um, as that level of damage is higher, so if there's damage occurring very high in the spinal cord, basically removing all of that um, sympathetic division. So if we have damage here cutting that, so that means that can't be activated. Um, that means that now you have a smaller amount or a decreased kind of sensation of anger. You, you're less angry. You're less fearful with a higher kind of damage. Now, as we start to go further down, so now you start to have more of that emotional or that physiological arousal from the, the sympathetic nervous system, you see that there's a progressive increase in that emotional reaction or it's less depressed. Lower thoracic, it continues, lumbar there. And what's interesting here, and, I'll, I, and I want to make this uh, point to you, is look at what happens if we just now have damage at the lowest sacral level. We actually see that there's an increase here for fear. Now, remember what was located down there? Oops, sorry. Down here at this lower part, we have a little bit of that rest and digest system here. So it doesn't really matter what's going on up here, but if we have damage down here to that, that lower level, now we don't have that rest and digest, and now what we see is that you can see some increase in emotionality a little bit. Uh, 
um, in terms of this, in, in terms of fear. There could be a little bit more fear associated with damage down there than what you would see uh, at these other levels. So as you have damage higher in the spinal cord, you're going to report less anger, less fear, less emotional reaction. But as you start to unwind that or you go further down the spinal cord, your ability to report that emotion increases. So this provides evidence that spinal cord injury at different levels are going to differentially impact the activation of the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions. And this is evidence that at this level, these are involved in emotion, that physiological arousal is involved in emotion. Now, where does this arousal then come to impact our perception? This is a level of arousal, and like I said, both anger and excitation or extreme happiness and joy, it does involve that arousal. It's just we have different uh, kinds of interpretations of that. Uh, where does this arousal then go and first impact or influence the brain's functioning? And that's going to be in the amygdala. The amygdala is a really important structure for processing that level of arousal that the body is uh, detecting. And Evidence for this is looking at stimulation. So if you are going under surgery, uh, brain surgery for uh, epilepsy or something, that's what most of these studies have found. Uh, if you stimulate the amygdala, what you find is these people repeat, re repeat uh, or report extreme fear or anxiety uh, if you um, stimulate that, that center of the brain, the amygdala. Remember, that's part of the limbic system, and it's involved. Here's the amygdala right here. If you stimulate that structure, uh, you're going to get these people saying, I feel extremely dreadful. Uh, I have extreme fear or anxiety. So stimulation of that causes uh, 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 the sensations of emotions of extreme fear and anxiety. Now, lesions or damage to the amygdala is going to result in uh, complete loss of fear. These people don't have any fear whatsoever. Uh, and in fact, uh, sometimes uh, encephalitis can result in fairly targeted damage to the both a main line, one in the left hemisphere, one in the right, and that will result in kluver busey syndrome, where uh, these people will uh, have no fear whatsoever. Uh, they'll also show some kind of indiscriminate dietary behavior. They'll tend to eat many different things. They won't have conditioned taste aversions. Um, and they often will also examine objects by mouth. And uh, they'll show an increased sexual behavior, often with inappropriate objects uh, um, associated with this. So lesions, you see that you're kind of removing a lot of the ability to feel and detect emotions. Now, is that all? Is that where emotion stops? No. The highest level of processing this information occurs in the prefrontal cortex. So the prefrontal cortex is essential. It receives, uh, remember it's that tertiary cortical tissue. So it receives highly processed information from multiple cortical areas. And so it's going to be receiving information from the amygdala, uh, reporting information about that level of arousal. It'll also be receiving information from other parts of the brain, such as uh, um, areas that are involved in rewards, such as the ventral tegmental area, sensory uh, association cortex, uh, that, that's areas in the parietal, as well as areas in the temporal cortex, uh, thalamic input, uh, uh, information, sensory processing, and it then can influence the rest of the brain, such as the basal ganglia, uh, the posterior parietal cortex. So it's situated in an area where it's high, receiving this highly processed information, detecting what is going on in terms of sensory information. So you have the arousal, you have that further amplification, amplification or, or, uh, of that from the amygdala, but you also have the context. You have the situation that you're in, and it helps you appraise that emotion. So that um, 
this situation or this pivotal point of the frontal cortex was capitalized in the 1950s because people recognized if you damaged the uh, frontal or prefrontal cortex, this often muted. So instead of seeing Kluver Busey syndrome uh, that had a number of problems, this would often just mute the individual a little bit. So if they had some kind of psychiatric complaint uh, uh, um, or just some behavioral problems in the 1950s, these individuals were, would be slated then to receive a frontal lobotomy uh, where a um, device was inserted through the uh, eye cavity and moved back and forth to disconnect those connections that we talked about here between the prefrontal cortex and the rest of the cortex. Basically, taking that ability to contextualize that emotion and removing it. And so these people uh, were impaired in being able to produce emotions, so they weren't able to produce, they were muted uh, kind of in terms of their emotions. They were also able, uh, unable to uh, recognize emotions, so they couldn't tell if someone was happy or if they're sad or if they're angry or if they're disgusted. They weren't able to do and engage in those kinds of emotions. And they were, you could also tell this from their speech. So speech often has certain inflection patterns that indicate that you're you know, happy or asking a question or angry, those patterns are critical and they couldn't exhibit that or they failed to show a, a change in their speech that could convey that emotion um, as well. In addition, um, they didn't show, there's a classic kind of study done in 1989 looking at how there's a certain amount of feedback that comes from the activation of the muscles in your face. It's, um, it's, uh, imagine, here, let's do this. Um, put a, um, um, a pencil in your mouth, and when you do that, what you'll notice, uh, or people have reported, is they feel a little bit higher. Whereas if you put a pencil between your lips, that triggers more of a frown, and people report turning to tending to be more angry. That was a study that demonstrated that there's some facial feedback that comes from activating those muscles that tells us that we're either happy or angry. Um, while these people would be impaired, uh, they wouldn't be able doing that same, same kind of manipulation, either putting the pencil between their teeth or putting the pencil within their lips, would uh, they would not be able to see, show a differential response to that. However, they did have intact logic. It's just they weren't able to have the emotion that's critical for applying that logic in daily life. So they would have a lot of problems with daily planning uh, and engaging in that. So this creates a whole cluster of problems that are centered around being able to use, process that emotional information. So the prefrontal cortex is very important for contributing to emotion. Our next topic um, that again falls under this category of factors that influence behavior is motivated behavior. And we can talk about different types of behaviors. Um, that are motivated, that activate us or energize us to engage in uh, certain behaviors. And we could talk about regulatory behaviors that are essential for the survival of an organism. You can think of eating. If we don't eat, we'll uh, eventually we'll die. If we don't drink, eventually we'll die. Those are good examples of regulatory behaviors. In addition to those, we have other regulatory behaviors that are activated because we're getting away from that set point, such as if you start to feel cold, you'll shiver, trying to bring the body back into a regulatory range. So those are all regulatory behaviors that as the body starts to drift away, from a certain point, then uh, the, the body will become activated or certain systems will be activated to try to return it back to that set point or that, that, uh, that optimal functioning zone. Um, so uh, 
you can imagine this is like how a house has a thermometer and it regulates uh, the heating and the air conditioning based on that set point, whether you decide to put it, uh, you know, at certain degrees, 65 degrees, the, if the temperature starts to drop below 65 degrees, the heater will turn on and that will um, uh, then cause the house to heat up. As it gets above 65 degrees, then the heater will turn off. And that's the same kind of thing that we see in these regulatory behaviors. As certain systems start to change and get below or outside of that zone, then certain behaviors will be activated, certain sensations will be triggered that will try to return the system back to its original state or that set point. We also have non-regulatory behaviors uh, that are motivated as well. A good example of that would be aggression, uh, this, this uh, tendency to uh, uh, try to, when someone comes into your territory or come into your house, you'll want to protect that house. Uh, uh, that will trigger certain aggressive behaviors. Um, uh, another non-regulatory but motivated behavior is sex. Um, and that is a behavior that which people uh, engage in, um, but if you don't engage in it, you're not going to die. Uh, so, and exploration, uh, finding out things, exploring, those are good examples of non-regulatory behaviors that we're still motivated. We'll engage in them. We will uh, expend resources in order to engage in those uh, uh, kinds of behaviors. What we'll focus the rest of this section talking about in terms of motive behavior, motivated behaviors are regulatory behaviors. There's a little bit more work has been done in terms of understanding some of the neural factors that influence them. Work's been done looking at non-regulatory behaviors. Um, uh, for a while, such as aggression, trying to understand why people have become aggressive. Um, but we don't um, have time to go into that here. Um, so in terms of um, motivated behaviors, uh, one of the things that I think is good or interesting to do is talk about that feeding system, eating, and what factors influence that. Well, we have two important sources of energy for the body. Um, the first is a short-term energy source, or short-term energy store, and it really reflects the amount of uh, glucose that's available for the brain and the body. And as uh, the glucose is circulating through the body, it's going to be used, and then we're going to gradually decrease it. But if you eat a meal, what happens is the glucose starts to rise, starts to rise, and it starts to get too... Gets it's basically too high, and what happens is the liver uh, will start to store glucose, but it doesn't store glucose as glucose, it stores it as glycogen, and it's because the pancreas uh, starts to release insulin. So insulin causes the glucose that's in the blood to be stored within the liver as glycogen. Now the pancreas can change and stop releasing insulin and start to release glucagon. So let's say that you've gone a while uh, without eating and your blood level starts, blood glucose level starts to drop, then what happens is glucagon is released and, uh, and that causes glycogen in the liver to be converted to glucose that now will be circling through the blood. So there is a finite amount of glycogen that can be stored within the liver, uh, but for short-term energy supply, it involves both insulin and glucagon regulating the amount of glucose that's in the blood supply. But as that supply is deplenished, then we have to tap into our long-term energy store, and that's found in our autopose tissue or our fat tissue as stored as triglycerides. Now, there are two important uh, triglycerides. We have glycerol, which is converted exclusively. So glycerol is only used to convert glucose in terms of use for the brain. So the brain has that special energy demands that's distinct from the body, and glycerol is turned directly into glucose for the brain. Fatty acids, as they're converted into um, energy for the body, um, they're converted into energy for the body. 
So we see that the autopose tissue will uh, um, take and store long term, so much longer than what the short term can can do. And there is a division where glycerol will be used to convert glucose for use for the brain, whereas fatty acids uh, can be used for the rest of the body. So given these two stores, what are factors that start and stop a meal? So we know the long-term store. We see that um, there's this fluctuation of storing glucose in the liver versus having the appropriate level of glucose in the bloodstream. And insulin and glucagon regulate that process. We also know that there are these re resources fat stores out in the adipose tissue that also represents a, a good, valuable source of energy. But um, what starts and stops a meal? Well, we can talk about purely physiological factors. So anytime uh, that there's a, a change in the short-term store or long-term store, that can start a meal. So for example, if we inject you with insulin, that's going to cause a drop in your blood sucrose level or blood sugar level. And that is uh, going to then uh, uh, make you feel hungry. So we can uh, just inject you with insulin and we can start to get you, make you feel like you're hungry. Um, also, like I said, if you wait long enough, you're going to, uh, you're going to use those resources of, um, that's in the short-term store up, and that natural drop in glucose will re result in hypoglycemia, and you'll also start to feel hungry. That's what will start a meal. Um, you could also have a long-term change in the stores where you gradually deprive someone and decrease their long-term store. That will also initiate a meal as well. But we found that that's not the whole story. That's not the whole story of what starts a meal. There are also strong environmental factors uh, that will determine when you start a meal. Um, Non-human animals, for example, um, will adjust times between meals based on the size of the last meal. So the meal schedule in uh, non-human animals is al almost always based on how big was the last meal. Uh, when uh, um, so they're using that to adjust times, whereas humans don't. They tend to have several meals across the day. So they adjust the size of the meal uh, based on um, uh, the time of the day. <clears throat> so the meal schedule is a, is a clear environmental factor depending on what time of the day, whether or not you're going to, how much you're going to eat. So we adjust the size of the meal based on uh, the time of our, our last meal, whereas uh, non-human animals will adjust time between meals. So uh, we see that there's one strong difference is the schedule uh, is, is different but, uh, for individuals. Another important factor is social context. So uh, a study done uh, in 1989 had people keep diaries of um, what they ate and who they were with. So they would uh, write down uh, um, how many people they were there, the, the people that they were eating with, and how much food they consumed. And what they found was there is a fairly direct relationship. As the number of people increased, the amount of food that was consumed increased. Uh, so social context uh, is important. So if people ate by themselves, they would eat less food. Whereas if people ate in larger groups, they ten, tended to eat more. Uh, food consumed increased with the number of people present. Um, so social context plays an important role, as well as the meal schedule. There's some other factors that also influence what starts a meal. And we refer to those generally um, uh, in terms of, uh, oh, I mean, what stops a meal as head factors. Uh, they are used in terms of your eyes, your nose, and your tongue. Basically learning about the food that you're eating. Learning that certain uh, foods are high or rich in calories or energy, and other foods are low in uh, calories or energy. 
And so you can develop what we refer to as conditioned taste preference. Certain foods are high in energy, and so we start to prefer those. And so what happens is that animals can modulate their food preferences based on these taste caloric kinds of associations. Now this creates an interesting situation um, because we can actually have favorable food, but because we can introduce certain artificial sweeteners, we can um, actually uh, change that association. So a certain flavor um, can become associated with no food. And the question is, how does that impact what stops a meal? By introducing that kind of stimulus into our diet. And Swithers um, is a researcher uh, that has looked at this, and they found some really interesting results. So what they did is they had two groups of animals. Here's the graphs here. Uh, one group of animals was eating a yogurt. So as we can see here in panel A, on the y-axis is body weight that was gained. Uh, in these rats, and on the x-axis here are days uh, across here. And what we're plotting is the body weight gained when they were provided access to either a glucose sweetened yogurt or a saccharin, artificial sweetened yogurt here. And so what we see is rats tend to gain more weight when they are given access to an artificial sweetener yogurt uh, relative to rats that are given access to a regular glucose sweet yogurt. And so that weight gain that we see is more pronounced in those animals. Now they had access to other food. This was, they would just come in, uh, they would be given access, one group would get this artificial sweetened yogurt, the other one would get the glucose sweetened yogurt. And what they found is that the artificial sweetened yogurt, those animals were uh, observed to gain more weight relative to those animals that had the glucose sweetened yogurt. Now, uh, the second panel, panel B, uh, is following the termi termination of that additional yogurt presentation, there were, they continue to gain weight, but the groups did not differ. There was no difference. So this is suggested a role for um, um, these artificial sweeteners changing that that uh, food preference and uh, showing that it's not just a closed system, but you may start to prefer other foods more uh, because they're associated with actual calories. Now, um, work is done. Is this the complete story? Is all this terminating? No, you can actually have a gastric fistula planted where you have the person eating, or, I mean the, the rat eating, but all the food is progressively um, removed from the stomach, and they'll continue, they'll eat continuously. So that means while well, head factors uh, such as eye, nose, and tongue play a role in, in maybe what terminates a meal or stops a meal, they aren't the complete story. There are other levels of processing of this that are important. And so another important factor is the stomach or stomach factors. And so uh, what you can do is uh, an interesting study conducted in rats as well is if you allow an, a rat to consume food, but you have a pyloric cuff that prevents it from leaving the stomach and you remove some of the food and replace it with saline, so a non-caloric non um, uh, additive, and you do that over days, so they're allowed to eat food, fill up the stomach, you remove some of the stomach contents, replace it with saline, what happens is the animals will start to adjust their eating to compensate for the, the calories that are removed, suggesting that part of the what stops or gives that sensation of full or satiety, that sensation that you've eaten enough, comes from the stomach. Um, uh, and part of that, that is important there. So uh, by removing that food in the stomach and replacing the saline and seeing that over days they start to accommodate that removal of calories uh, that was associated with it suggests that the stomach is able to detect the amount of calories that uh, are, are located there. Now is that all? No. Well, in addition, we have intestinal factors. So you can do um, uh, um, infusion of food into the duodenum, 
that is the first part of the small intestine uh, here where the stomach empties into there. And so if you in infuse food into that location, that will actively suppress the intake of food. So you can have uh, an animal, a rat that's eating food and that food's being removed. And then as soon as you insert some of that food into the duodenum, what happens is that will immediately suppress that uh, food intake. So this suggests that the duodenum is also an important factor contributing to stopping a meal or generating that sensation of satiety uh, or feeling full um, as well. So these are all factors that work in the short term. What about long term? And that's where we turn to autopose tissue. Uh, remember the long term store um, plays a very important role in stopping meals as well. And um, it does so, we'll talk about this in a little bit, um, uh, through a compound or um, uh, leptin that we'll talk about. But in this study, what they did is they force fed rats. Uh, so here, these uh, open circles represent the amount of energy consumed in uh, rats that weren't force fed. And then these um, unfilled triangles represent the force fed rats, what they were forced to consume. And then the black triangles represent the actual, in, um, what they consumed on their own in their cage. And so what we see is as we increase um, the amount of food, uh, so on the y-axis is the amount of energy that they consume, on the x-axis is days, and what we see is when we start force feeding these rats, we increase the amount of calories that they consume, and they also start to decrease the amount of, uh, of food that they're consuming net, um, in their cage when they're there. So there is an increase in that uh, um, calories they stop eating, and this is what we'd expect a normal rat to consume over days. So we see they have a fairly standard level. If we start to force feed them, that decreases the amount of food that they spontaneously take on. Now day zero, that's where we stop uh, force feeding them, and now we start to see that they will uh, start to consume food on their own. What changes with this is uh, that signal is leptin that is a uh, protein produced by fat cells. And so we see that on the same time scale, so we see the body weight starts to increase here. And we see that uh, the animals that are just consuming normally, they're showing us uh, here, uh, they're increasing weight, but the animals that are force feed are increasing much faster here. And we also see that leptin is increasing much fast, faster. So leptin is that protein that's produced by fat cells. So increasing leptin decreases that feeding behavior. So if there's more leptin, there's more of that, uh, that signal that will terminate or eliminate that. So we see that energy intake increases, there's an increase in body weight, and there's an increase in leptin, but there's a decrease in that spontaneously eating behavior. After we terminate that, we see that the leptin starts to go down that force feeding decreases, and we see leptin goes down, and we see a restoration of that spontaneous eating. So that leptin plays an important role in regulating that set point of where you should be uh, in terms of eating every day. So leptin is, is that, that thermostat setting that point. And if you start to push it, so we're overheating the system, or we're overfeeding the system, you see an increase in body weight, but you also see an increase in the amount of leptin that's being released. And so you see that that continues. Once we stop that process of overfeeding, the leptin decreases, we see the body weight levels off, and now we start to see some of that eating occurring. Another piece of evidence that suggests that leptin is an important point uh, or important factor protein in this is looking at OB, OB mice. These are mice that are, um, that have a genetic mutation where leptin is not produced and so they become obese um, in, in terms of uh, they don't have that signal of when to stop eating and so they consume more and more food. Um, what we can do with these OB mice 
is we can actually take and inject them with leptin. And so on the y-axis is the amount of food that they're consuming. And the black bar represents a, a group of mice that receive vehicle. The white bar represents, uh, or saline, that's what vehicle means, or, or a drug that has no effect. The white bar represents a group of mice that get infused leptin, uh, six pickle molars of leptin, or another group that gets 60 pickle molar, uh, three pickle molars of leptin, and the striped bar is a group that receives 60 pickle molars of leptin. And what we see is as you increase that amount of leptin, there is a progressive decrease in these obese mice in the amount of food that they consume over a three-hour period. We also see that that continues across 24 hours, but if you wait after 24 hours, we start to see that it loses its effect and you'll have to have another injection uh, of leptin in order to start to reduce that food-taking behavior. Effect. So leptin uh, um, uh, could be working uh, to suppress this uh, uh, eating behavior. So where could leptin be having its effect? Well, one structure we think that leptin could be having its effect uh, in the brain is the hypothalamus. And why do we think that? Well, the hypothalamus has two components, both the lateral hypothalamus and the ventral medial hypothalamus. And lesions to the lateral hypothalamus, uh, will rats will stop eating. But if you stimulate the hypothalamus, rats will start eating. So we kind of consider the, the lateral hypothalamus as the gas pedal. But as it's activated, it's increased, it's going to start to trigger or activate eating behavior. Whereas the ventral medial hypothalamus, in contrast, is considered the brake pedal because if you were to lesion, if you were to lesion the ventral medial hypothalamus, rats never stop eating. They continuously eat. Whereas you stimulate the lateral, the, the ventral medial hypothalamus, what happens is they'll stop eating. So if you actually stimulate the ventral medial hypothalamus, will stop eating, so it's considered the break. Now, here is an example of a study where we would go in and lesion the ventral medial hypothalamus. Here is a control brain uh, of a rat. Here is a, a rat that had damage to the ventral medial hypothalamus, and you can see the damage down here. Now, if we look, what happens is the rat that receives those lesions to the ventral medial hypothalamus, they start to show an impressive uh, weight gain. And these are in grams. Uh, so they are showing a very impressive amount of weight compared to a control rat that doesn't receive those lesions. And to give you an idea of what a rat that would look like around this area above 1,000 grams, here is a picture of a rat and what we'd expect a normal rat to be around uh, maybe uh, 300 grams. This is a, a rat that's around 1,000 plus grams here. So the lateral hypothalamus uh, is the gas. So when it's stimulated, we start to eat. When it's lesioned, we stop eating. The ventral medial hypothalamus is the brake pedal. Uh, and so if it's lesioned, rats never stop eating. They continue to eat. And they often eat. What's interesting with the ventral medial uh, hypothalamus lesions is that these animals will eat indiscriminately, as will humans. So if a human has a tumor in this area, this uh, ventral uh, medial area here, what happens is they'll eat indiscriminately too and they'll continuously eat. They'll eat their clothes, they'll eat flowers, they'll eat blue, anything they'll eat. They'll just continuously eat. So if there's a tumor there destroying those neurons, they'll show this indiscriminate eating behavior as well. So that concludes this lecture looking at uh, different aspects that influence behavior. We covered a lot of ground talking about the impact or influence of and evolutionary factors and our uh, innate releasing mechanisms and fixed action patterns. We talked about a number of ways that we learn from the environment, such as um, classical conditioning and instrumental or operant conditioning. And then we saw that there are some restrictions based on our evolutionary history of what can be learned 
from the environment, talking about the Garcia effect. We talked a little bit about um, um, emotional behavior and its relationship to certain neural structures, uh, the spinal cord, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex. And then we talked about motivated behaviors. We focused on these regulatory behaviors. and, and uh, So again, now you want to engage with those uh, practice exams and the lecture quiz. Um, and we have one last chapter, which will be sleep. And we'll take that up next time. Talk to you soon.